Hello, you're all very welcome to Trust and Atira. My name is Liam Shorthall. This evening's talk, which is one I've been really looking forward to myself, is entitled How Railway and Dockyard Workers Defied an Empire, the Irish Munitions Embargo of 1920. We shall see the part this action of civil resistance played in the War of Independence. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Peter Rigney to talk to us this evening. Peter holds a PhD in history from Trinity College Dublin and is a former industrial officer with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Peter, you're very welcome to Trust and Atira. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you and uh, welcome to everyone. What I want to talk to you about tonight is probably one of the greatest pieces of civil resistance that occurred during the struggle for independence. But strangely enough, it was neglected and has been neglected by most historians. The first person to tackle it in a really historical way, ironically enough, was a locomotive driver in 1967, sorry, yeah. This is a guy called Martin O'Sullivan, a driver in that loan, locomotive driver in that loan, an activist in the Trade Drivers Union, ASLEF. And he wrote this in 1967, a two page article uh, for the Irish Independent called How Railwomen Defined an Empire, which I lifted for the title of a pamphlet, How Railwomen and Dockers Defined an Empire, which will become clearer later. And in this, he expressed wonderment that uh, this was a year after the 1916 commemorations. And I remember as a kid, the sort of wall to wall commemorations of 1916. And this guy who had been a participant in the munition strike said, hey, you know, this has been covered wall to wall last year. Nobody wrote out about our dispute, why? And he actually wrote to the heads of history department of various colleges and got no reply. And in fact, it wasn't until 12 years later that an English historian of empire, a guy called Charles Townsend, wrote an article in the, on the munition strike um, in the journal Irish Historical Studies. Now, while Irish Historical Studies is, a, is a, a wonderful historical journal, it doesn't exactly command a mass audience. So the, 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 the subject has been relatively untouched by historians. So to give you some background to the railway system, there were 28 separate railway companies they had been under government control since December 1916. There was a, a threatened strike by locomotive drivers and the government said they couldn't face that due to war. So they did the same as they did to the British Railways in September 1914. They took them under government control and they paid them compensation based on 1913 profits. So hold that thought, based on 1913 profits. There was a, a big crossover between the railway directors and the business elite. Railways would have been a, 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 a blue chip share. They would have been rather like banking shares were between the um, before the crash of 2008. So, for example, the chairman of the biggest company, the Great Southern and Western, Sir William Goulding, uh, had interests in fertilizers, uh, was a member of the Irish Privy Council. His brother was a Conservative MP at Westminster. Frank Brook, the chairman of the Dublin Southeastern Railway, one of the smaller Dublin companies, was again a member of the Irish uh, Privy Council a friend of Lord French's and a steward of the Turf Club. The companies were as follows. Uh, Great Southern and Western Railway ran Houston. I'm going to use contemporary names where they exist. Houston to Cork, Limerick and Waterford. Largest company operated one third of the system. The Great Northern, the line from Connolly to Belfast and Westford, well, most of which was closed between 1957 and 1965, uh, mainly at the instigation of the Northern government. Most of its system was in Ulster. The Midland Great Western Railway, Broadstone to Galway, Mayo and Sligo. Uniquely, most of its system still survives. And the Dublin and Southeastern Railway, uh, Wexford to Waterford via, and Waterford via New Ross. And the other parties to this were the trade unions. Uh, the Railway Clerks Association, well, that's pretty, pretty obvious what it is. Today, it's the Transport Salaried Staffs Association and the only one of these unions which operates in Ireland. ASLEF, the Locomotive Craft Union, still exists in Britain, but has withdrawn from Ireland since 1968 and had been making inroads into the National Union of Railwomen since 1911. The big player was the NUR, the National Union of Railwomen, uh, had, had most of the members, uh, but by, and by 1920, for reasons I'll explain, membership was growing rapidly. A big player was J.H. Thomas. J.H. Thomas subsequently played a part in British politics, was colonial secretary. He was MP for Derby. Derby is a railway town since 1910. General Secretary of the NUR since 1916 and a Privy Councillor since 1917. 
So the only Irish union that plays any significant part is the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. It, it does that by its, its, uh, its dock workers' presence. So in 1911, the railway companies had seen off and defeated a strike on the question of sympathetic strikes, on the question of handling tainted goods. So from that point on, um, the railway companies resolved that the, their employees would carry whatever traffic the, that was offered. However, in March 1920, food prices were decontrolled after the war. There is an impression out there that the war ended on the 11th of the 11th, 1918. It didn't. The emergency powers of the war only ended in mid-1921. And indeed, on a broader front, if you look at Eastern Europe, the current scholarship is the war didn't really end until 1923, when the Poles stopped fighting the Russians, the Poles stopped fighting the Ukrainians, the Lithu Lithuanians stopped fighting the Russians and the Poles, and indeed the Irish Civil War ended. However, here is March 1920, and it's a memo from the harbour master Ross Lair to his boss on the Great Southern and Western Railway, saying basically the background to this is there's a Sinn Féin labour campaign to stop the export of food from Ireland to Britain because it's felt that if the market is totally decontrolled, market prices with the higher level of, of earnings in Britain will just suck food out of Ireland and cause a famine. So unless there was a, a, a label on the butter to which you can see here, it wouldn't be handled. Now, the response in March 1920 uh, from the Department of Transport Ireland, who bear in mind were managing the railways, was basically do not rock the boat, more or less saying, not in these words, of course, Ireland is bad enough without a railway strike, so just hang back. So the railway strike occurred in the following phases. And in May 1920, it kicked off. And the background to this is way far in Eastern Europe. In May 1920, uh, the Poles and the infant Soviet Union were in a battle with each other on their frontier. Uh, now the Poles defeated the Soviets at the gates of Warsaw. And there was a, a move to export arms from Great Britain to the Poles. There was a huge fear among ordinary English people that Winston Churchill would drag um, Great Britain or the United Kingdom back into a war with Soviet Russia. And the political intelligence department that predates MI6 said the view among working men is far stronger than anything we've encountered since the end of the war and people will not go to war again. So in May 1920, J.H. Thomas, of whom I've spoke, sorry, in May 1920, a boat called the Jolly George mo moored in London and they were unloading fi loading field guns for Poland. And the dockers um, subsequently boycotted the ship and went to their union gen general secretary, Ernest Bevan, subsequently a, a foreign, foreign secretary under the 1945 Labour government. And Bevan said, I'll back you. He says, because if the government of Russia is to be changed, it's a matter for the Russian people. But he said, conversely, if the government of Britain is to be changed, uh, it is a matter for the British people. So following on that, there was a blockade on munitions to Russia. And the NUR issued a directive to its members not to handle munitions for Russia. Following on that, um, a guy called Michael Donnelly, who was a Dublin docker, saw a, a, um, a boat called the Anadoret Boog moored under the 100 ton crane on Dublin's north wall. Um, with armoured cars and lorries for the British Army. And he walked up to Liberty Hall and said to the Union General Secretary, William O'Brien and Thomas Thorne. Now bear in mind, William O'Brien, although not a participant, had been interned in Frongox since 1916. Um, and he said, look, let's, let's boycott this boat. And the Union guys said, yeah, okay, we will do that. Now that was done and the Royal Engineers had to unload the boat. Now that did nothing to the Dockers employment contract because Dockers were casual. You turned up for a boat, if the stevedore, if a hundred men turned up and the stevedore wanted 50 men, he picked 50 men and 50 men went home. And the stevedore wanted to make money off unloading ships and didn't particularly care about people's political aspirations. He was, if you like, a labor only subcontractor. So a couple of, about a week later, 
another boat came in called the Polberg, and it went into the Admiralty Wharf, Dunleary. Now, the clue as to the ownership is in the title Admiralty Wharf. And a man called Christopher Morn, uh, and this comes out in a statement to the Bureau of Military History. A man called Christopher Morn was delegated. He worked in the Dublin Southeastern Railway in Pier Station. He saw his roster, and his roster was go with the locomotive and a guards van to Dunleary and pick up 20 wagons of munitions and take them to Houston Station for handover to the Great Southern and Western Railway. It was a Sunday morning, and Morn said to himself, There's a union directive that English workers shouldn't handle munitions destined for a war in Eastern Europe. So why should I handle munitions to, if you like, damage my own people? So he went around and he talked to various people and he said, I am not going, it's a union directive. So if you like, Irish members of the NUR took a directive that was never intended for them, but they interpreted it and the thing kicked off. Now, Morn wasn't sanctioned because the companies were under an instruction in relation to food exports from March, don't rock the boat. So this is the phases in the dispute. And I'll go through them in, in, in series. May, don't rock the boat, avoid a railway strike. In June, the NUR convened a conference of its Irish branches and it will say, well, look, let's see what this conference brings. In July, on the civilian side, there was a preparation for mass dismissals, while on the army was deciding, look, we're not going to tender, so this is too difficult for us. And from August to mid-October, there was a stalemate. And then from October to December, the plan by the British was to, quote, throttle the Irish railway system. So by May to June 1920, um, these are, are quotations from the, the, the high, highest levels of the British admin. Hammer Greenwood, Irish, Irish secretary, uh, a man notorious for not telling the truth. In, in fairness, he wouldn't have told as many lies as Boris Johnson, that has to be said. But up to then, he probably held the Boris Johnson perpetual trophy for telling lies in the House of Commons. Our forces are still glued to the ground and we cannot succeed until their mobility is greater than theirs. Uh, Neville McCready, uh, Sir Neville McCready, the commander of British forces in Ireland, the troops are now stationary except for the cavalry. And the important thing to remember is in 1919, the British Army sold, or set up a thing called the Army Disposal Board and sold off their lorries. Uh, the ones they kept were the, the worst ones. They sold off the best ones. So what the army was left with in Ireland was dross, mechanical dross, and they were short of spares. So running a, a transport system by road was just not on. Now, here we see in the 29th of July, 1920, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a, a copy uh, letter from the chairman of the Irish, the Irish Railway Manager Standing Committee to the Great Northern Railway and saying that we're, we are going to, um, we're, we're going to prepare for mass dismissals. Sorry, I need to step back for a moment. The NUR was obviously deeply divided. One, it was an unofficial action with full support of the majority of their members in the South and West of Ireland. However, the majority of NUR members were in the North and East, and at least two thirds of them were of a unionist persuasion. So they were faced with the situation as, how do we try and hold the union together? So they convened a conference of their Irish branches in Bristol. And they, if you like, cobbled up a composite motion, as union conferences quite frequently do, uh, which held a unified position but did nothing to solve the dispute and suggested that the matter be taken up with the TUC and that the General Secretary would uh, seek a meeting with the Prime Minister. So by the 29th of July, nothing had come from the NUR Bristol conference and we're looking at mass dismissals. And then things rapidly change. That's from the file of the Dublin and Southeastern Railway uh, to the general manager who was on his holidays in the Falmouth Hotel. Chairman shot Westland Road today. Frank Brook um, was part of the Dublin business elite. He was one of the Brooks of Fermanagh. He lived in Coolatton County Wicklow where he was a land agent. Um, chairman of the Dublin Southeastern Railway, steward of the Turf Club, member of the British of the Irish Privy Council, friend of Lord French, 
and very strongly advocated bringing in uh, the Royal Engineers to run the trains. So on a Saturday morning in July 1920, uh, Jim Slattery and Paddy Daly of the squad paid a visit to Brooke in Westland Row and shot him dead. They didn't know why he was shot dead. Uh, David Nelligan, who was one of Collins' spies in the castle, says he, he was shot dead because he was advocating bringing in Royal Engineers. Now, in another witness statement, uh, somebody else from the squad said, following that, at least one railway general manager made contact with the IRA and said he wasn't spying and wanted to, if you like, make his peace with them. Now, that's a garbled version of events whereby the aforementioned Neil, that's E.A. Neil, whom you saw a slide ago, general manager of the Great Southern and Western Railway, as I am almost certain, set up a secret line of communication with Michael Collins and the IRA. So here you have a strange situation that you have, if you like, a, an insurgency with where one side is declared illegal, where you have the largest private sector company in the country setting up a, a secret channel of communication. Now, that's just a typical, um, a typical report. The file is, is, is full of these. Um, it's, it's, it's full of these reports. What's significant about this is on the 12th of August, the railway was beginning to run out of crews. Um, and they, just, they said no one was to be dismissed without specific instruction from the board. So there's, if you like, a bit of a pullback from, from, mass, um, from mass dismissals. So you have at this stage, the Castle administration saying, we manage the railway company, we pay these people a huge amount for their 1913 profits, and yet they will not carry our soldiers. What is going on here? And in some cases, it would appear, although you would need a forensic accountant to go through it, but in some cases, the railway company were actually claiming back the wages of men they had suspended or dismissed. But anyway, that's another story. And again, this is another uh, typical uh, turn of events in the Waterford area, where a part, a leave party uh, from Fermoy, and Fermoy would have been a big military location, had to wait about three days to get a driver and guard to take them, uh, to take them probably to, to Waterford or possibly to Ross Lair to go on leave. So by this stage, you're looking at the restriction um, in services. You're looking at the suspension of passenger services between Waterford and Limerick, the suspension of passenger services west of Athlone, and the closure of a number of railways. The reason for this is because they're running out of crew. So now we come uh, to the position in Ulster. And here, the loyal railway workers of Derry. That's interesting because one would, I immediately would have expected that they were the loyal railway workers of London Derry, but they're not. They're the loyal railway workers of Derry. And from their perspective, their unions were being used for a political purpose against their political interest. Um, so you have, if you go to, um, to the local press, for example, you will find NUR branch meetings in Bambridge and Ballymena saying, we fully support the government and they should uh, offer, offer traffic, government traffic to the railways and have it carried. And anyone who doesn't carry it should be dismissed. On the other hand, you go to Derry and you find we fully uh, sympathize with our colleagues on the London Derry and Loxwilly Railway who have refused to carry arms and facilitate um, another Amritsar massacre, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Ulster is different. And this is where you come to the position of intimidation. I think of, from, from memory, of the 48 incidents of intimidation that are recorded during the strike, 43 of them are on the Great Northern Railway. And it's for two reasons. One, obviously, many Protestant workers do not agree with the munition strike, but also it's important to remember that in Ulster, most Catholics did not support Sinn Féin. They supported the Irish Parliamentary Party. They supported Joe Devlin. Um, and if you go through the witness statements, some of the bitterest political struggles in the 19, 1921 periods in Ulster were between, if you like, Joe Devlinites, Irish Parliamentary Party people, and Sinn Féin on the other hand. 
So by this stage, you were having an increased amount of dismissal and, and suspensions, and you're having a, um, a group of workers in the north saying, if you try and reinstate these people, we will go on strike. So we now come to, a, if you like, a, a, a boree in a side road, is you, what happened in July 1920 in Belfast. In July 1920 in Belfast, there was a series of expulsions of workers from a number of workplaces. The majority, but not all of them, were Catholics. And a lot were what were termed by their expellers to be rotten prods, quote unquote, who were people who expressed strong trade union or socialist opinions. But there is, and I, I haven't got it here, but there is uh, the transcript of an interview between the manager of the Great Northern Railway in relation to the wagon works in Adelaide, Belfast, and the expellers. And the expellers are listed by their, their, grade, their name, their grade, their trade union, and their attitude, which is, are classified as moderate, extreme, and irreconcilable. And what the loyalist expellers say, I'm sorry, the unionist expellers say is, we're not anti-Catholic because we didn't go after Catholic drivers and firemen because these men are defying the munition strike and they are carrying traffic normally. So when you get into Ulster, you, you get into considerable complexity. Sorry, another thing here is in relation to the use of the term loyalist. This has nothing to do with the munition strike. Um, when we use the word loyalist now, it means a certain thing. Loyalist in 1920 and 21 and 22 means something else. And it is not exclusively Protestant because there were people who were Catholics who had strong loyalties to the crown. And there were people maybe who had strong home rule tendencies, but, but who would have been intimidated or victimized and gone to England and would have claimed under the badge of loyalism. Now then of course, Ireland being Ireland, there are people who dual claimed, and there is a story and I haven't managed to verify it, but I got it on unimpeachable authority of one claim that goes in and says, I was always loyal to the crown uh, for, my, for my troubles. My business was constantly raided by the IRA and I was driven out of business. The same person put in a claim to military service pension saying, I was unswervingly loyal to the Republic for my troubles. My business was constantly raided by the back, back and towns and I lost a, a load of money. But folks, this is Ireland. So on the Great Northern Railway, refusals were classified by a number of, of reasons. Uh, those who were smart used the Railway Clause 12. No, no servant must needlessly expose himself to danger. People who cited political principles or trade union principles found their names on this file, um, which is not a file you want to be on. This is used as the back cover and now some shameless product placement for this book, uh, which is the history of the ammunition strike written by myself and published by Irish Rail, uh, available in all good bookshops or online from um, bookshop.ie or from the online shop of the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland, also available in places like Alan Hannes and Vibes and Scribes in Cork. Anyway, uh, advert over. So you can, if you like, heat map the dispute. And because the dispute was unofficial from the point of view of the unions, the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress took the hands in the running of the dispute. Now, Tom Johnson was the second to the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress. Um, and he had already had experience with dealing with two disputes that were, if you like, or sorry, three disputes uh, to date in the War of Independence. Uh, one was the Limerick Soviet, which was a dispute over the use of, of permits to go to work in Limerick and a general strike. But that ended in, in, in a compromise within a week because there was, no, there was no money and money is the sinews of war and dispute. The second was a general strike in April, um, uh, April 1920, which secured the release of the Mount, Mount Joy hunger strikers. And the, the other was a uh, another dispute in 1919 which was over the use of motor permits for people who, who had cars, and that was unsuccessful. So what Johnson did immediately was to request um, trade, local trades councils to set up broad, broadly based organizations to take up collections in support of the, of the munition strikers. And 
the important figure they raised, because quoting 1920s money is useless, in today's money they raised about 5 million. And because it was raised by the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress, the, the, it was subject to audit and is published in their 1921 annual report. And that is online. If you go to the Decade of Centenaries um, on, on the National Archives website, you'll see the thing laid out in detail. So here's a few highlights. Firstly, where are the hotspots in dispute? Well, North Wall obviously is a very hot spot because there, there are a load of dockers out on strike and they're, they're, everyone is out on strike. Secondly, Limerick, where the Trades Council handle the money. Thirdly, Rosslare Harbour, where again, there's a lot more dockers out. And then you have Waterford, divided roughly 50-50 between the NUR and ASLEF. And then in, in middling places, um, you see places like uh, Clonus, Burtonport. Belfast is interesting, is, is significant for the small amount of money that is there. And then at the bottom, you see places that the railway doesn't go anymore, such as Ennistymon or Enniskillen. And again, you see £76 to Ennistymon, £72 to Enniskillen, Derry, Dunleary, uh, Castle Bar. Um, Sorry, I'm just lost lost my tra track of thought there for a moment. Sorry. Sorry, the w Waterford. There's one vital piece of evidence that comes from Waterford. <clears throat> there's a guy there called Martin White, who was a driver, who wrote a biographical article for the Journal of the Railway Record Society in the mid 1960s. And he describes in a fairly casual way. Uh, uh, hooking up to his train to go on the line from Waterford to Mallow and a party of De uh, the Devonshire Regiment being on the train and him saying I am not going to work this train he's told to uncouple his engine go to the shed and there he's dismissed now there is a ledger in the district manager's office, office in Waterford that details the if you like the characters of each locomotive crew member each, each guy has a page. So for Martin White's page, we know he was sacked because he wrote it. But there is no mention of the, of the dismissal. In fact, there's a mention that he was in 1921 after the strike was over. He was cautioned for having too big a fire on his engine in Carmel and wasting coal. And if you go through that leisure, you will see no mention of dismissal during the munitions strike. So obviously at some point, maybe it was before the assassination of Frank Brook, maybe it wasn't, but at some point, the railway at a management level uh, decided not, excuse me, I just need to keep an eye on my time. The, the railway decided not to record these dismissals as, as sacking offences, which is pretty strange because one would assume that normally if you're dismissed from a job that personnel or human resource would put on a file. This is a lovely little archive and it's from the end of the strike. The Cabinet Neatrum Railway didn't even possess a typewriter. I have formally written to the Secretary GPO saying that the entire train service on this line will be discontinued after tomorrow. As you will be aware, the mainline train service ceased on the night of the first instance. I hope to be run an occasional food train. And this shows, um, when we go into the next part of the strike, the importance of the railway. I've already mentioned the awfulness of the lorries and indeed the awfulness of the roads because the IRA made a habit of digging large trenches and roads and blowing up road bridges. Um, and so, so on this occasion, your man says, I've, I've shut the railway, I've no crew, I might be able to run, run the, the occasional food special. So this is towards the end game. Um, on the 14th of November, the Congress holds a meeting and say, look, as to whether you continue the strike or not, um, it's up to the railwaymen. November the 21st, bloody Sunday. November the 28th, Kilmichael. December the 10th, it's a little thing. Driver Lawler shot by the military in this month. Driver Lawler was a young man, 35 years of age, from Inchicore in Dublin. And he was outstationed in Lismore, probably on his promotion from fireman to driver. He was sent to the, the you know, the Siberia of the system. Uh, and he was walking back to his digs. He, he is coming from work because there's only one set of men in Lismore. And he shot about half an hour after the goods from Cork comes in uh, for, quote, refusing to obey a challenge. 
to stop when challenged. Now, when you get off the footbed of a steam locomotive, it's extremely noisy. And on a winter's night, with the ringing in his ears, it, it could be, if you like, an unfortunate accident, rather like so many of the British casualties, a deliberate atrocity. So then, then again, December the 10th and the 11th, the burning of Cork. Sorry. Yeah, okay, I'll come back to that. Also December the 10th, the declaration of martial law in most of Munster. That would have meant that railwaymen refusing traffic would have faced themselves in front of court marshals. December the 14th, the Congress Executive Meeting, and December the 21st, the NUR Conference. And a delegate called Jack Kenny from Inchico, um, who was a driver, and who would have known your man Lawler, who was shot on the 10th, proposed that they go back to work, provided there was no victimization. So they went back to work the following day, over the following couple of days. And in most places, there was no victimization, except on the Great Northern Railway, which I'll go into in a moment. But the Great Northern Railway actually adopted a more extreme position than General McCready, who gave an instruction to troops going back, who were going to be traveled by train, that there was to be no crowing and no provocation. And in fact, Immediately on the resumption of work, I wasn't sure if the strike was over. Detachment of troops walked down either from what is now Collins Barracks or what was Clancy Barracks to Kingsbridge thinking, we're going to go down to the station. We'll try and get on a train. They refuse us. The crew will be sacked and we'll go back and sit down and drink tea and smoke and play cards. And to their horror, they were taken on the train and brought to some godforsaken place like Valley Grove and then had to wait an age to come back again. So other munition strike, like quite frequently in the 1919 19 to 1923 period, people say, what if, or they should have done this, they should have done that. See, the great thing for students of history at any level is we know the plot. We know what happened before the credits rolled, but the people who were acting then didn't know that. So here's a few alternatives. 1944-45 Dutch railway strike. In 1944, the Dutch government in exile called a railway strike um, in, I think, September 1944, on the grounds that the Allies were going to punch forward, jump the rivers at Arnhem and get into, um, get into Germany. Now, we all know what happened there. It, did, it didn't go well. And the German Gauleiter of Holland, Seis Inquart, said, after an initial period of confusion by the Germans, he says, uh, unless the railwaymen go back to work, the Dutch people will starve. And that's precisely what happened. And in Dutch, Folklore and history, 1944-45 is known as the Hunger Winter. Um, and just like people at Nettles here during the famine, a lot of Dutch people lived on tulip poles. In 1951-52, the, uh, the largest union in France, the Confederation, Confederation Générale de Travail, tried to institute a boycott of munitions for the French colonial war of Indochina. And that was broken by mass dismissals and by the shooting of pickets. And the prefect of the town of Mar city of Marseille in his report said, the trade union has been decapitated in the docks. So when somebody says, oh, people should have done this, should have done that, they should look out at the way other uh, munitions strike end. An analysis of the dispute. It was a serious setback to military uh, operations in, in, in Ireland. That's from General McCready. Um, the other one is what was really under attack was the legitimacy of British rule. The railway, the railmen's opposition to British authority, which assumed governmental power in Ireland was a no notable contribution to this attack. That's Charles Townsend, the uh, English historian of empire who came and actually started writing up the history in 79. The third one is from a neutral observer because he's a military historian who's an officer in the United States Air Force, says the railwaymen and dockers performed an outstanding service for the Republican cause, all the more so because it was non-violent. And that's important. One of the safest places for a British soldier to be in the summer and autumn of 1920 was unarmed on a train because unarmed soldiers were carried on trains all the time. And for the IRA to ambush trains would have been a publicity disaster. And in fact, train ambushes only started after the end of the munition strike. Um, and, and I leave the final word of analysis to Martin O'Sullivan who said they were not firebound patriots or idealists, they were just ordinary working men carrying out their duties, but by their courage and unflinching stand, they show how unarmed men can defy and halt a mighty armed force. 
So I leave it at that. And if there's any questions, I have some other slides, but if there's any questions or discussions, I'll do my best to, to answer. Thank you very much, Peter. It's absolutely great to get, a, get the insight into it and particularly the, the international elements that inspired it, the, 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 um, the war between Poland and uh, the, the, the Soviet Union. Um, as, you, as, you say, if you're, as you say, you're happy to take a couple of questions. There's some uh, um, couple in the chat there. Um, Declan Byrne asks, would it be correct that Michael the Bishop Donnelly, with his Irish citizen army background, kick-started the blacking the area at the 100 ton crane on the North Wall extension and the berths outside the gates uh, were rail linked to Point Depot. This meant that cargo could be discharged directly from the vessel onto the rail trucks, which then went into the point. Was, was this a factor? Did the rail workers here decide to follow the dockers' actions? As far as I can make out, no. And, and that, that area was rail connected and up to the late 1990s, that was how new coaches were, were delivered. But the um, the first boat that Michael Donnelly uh, boycotted um, was separate, and they were unloaded, and they were they, they were unloaded and, and 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 driven off. And it wasn't, I think, until the guts of a week later that another ship went into Dunleary that the rail workers action kicked off. Okay, fair enough. Um, Owen Dunbar asks, um, do you know of a, a Jay Wilson of Dublin? Who was, uh, who was a, a engine driver and refused to drive troops or munitions? Did, did, did you know I, Jay Wilson? I don't. I, what? What? <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> For most of the railway companies, we don't have a list. We just Fair know enough. where somebody might say by by, uh, in the early stages they might say, well, you know, driver John refused to stop at Lucan Station and take aeroplane parts and bother on it. But by and large, names are not given. The exception is on the Great Northern Railway, where a different type of file survives. The Great Southern Western Railway file is high policy. It's the government, um, the department, department heads. The Great Northern file is the locomotive engineer. So you've handwritten notes from individual drivers saying, I didn't drive because I was afraid of being, being kidnapped. You've also interesting ones um, of a guy from Dundalk, um, whom, according to the, the 1911 census, was a Protestant and was on transfer from Belfast and said, I was taking a, a load of troops to Gormanstown and on the platform at Malahide, one of the, an RIC man came up to me smelling of drink and asked in a loud voice, was I going to take him? Um, and I said, I wouldn't take him beyond Drogheda. And I said, had the man not, you know, made it so obvious, I wouldn't have done it. Or I wouldn't have refused to draw it. And there was an interview with the supervisor, and the supervisor says the fault in this case is entirely with the uh, with the RSC man, but the, the 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 driver was still sacked. So the the, the quality of the inf of the archive depends upon where it survives. So for most of the railway companies, you don't have that sort of detailed information on a name by name basis. Fair enough. Um, I, my own thoughts. I was. I, I think it's very important that we. We look at this this labour element of the, the, the labour dispute element of the, the war of independence. I, I suppose I was wondering, what I was wondering as you went along was the I mean why was there a reluctance to 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 mention this even in in nineteen sixty six was it did that organised labour element not fit into the conservative narrative of the, of the no, new state? No, what was the well you see in nineteen sixty six I mean Connolly would have would have figured largely and well. The labour element in 1966 would have been the citizen army, and, and 60, 66, as I remember it, was, well, 1916 was a very military event. Um, and the other thing was the, the railwaymen were involved in British-based unions, uh, which for a long period of the, st of the state, the government didn't really approve of. And also, but also it was... In, in the same way as the Dáil Courts, it, it's not as glamorous. Like <clears throat> the people who wrote the books, and I'm not disparaging them in any way, were the guys who had the guns. And the, the reason quite frequently they needed is because they wrote the book because they needed the money. Like Dan Breen was running a speakeasy in New York when he wrote My Fight for Irish Freedom. I don't know about Tom Barry, but I know Ernie O'Malley needed the money. And unfortunately, we all know what happened with the libel action. So, you know, I, My Fight for Irish Freedom or On Another Man's Wound is a good, sexy title. You know, I was a Doyle Court judge. It's not exactly going to have 
toxic crowds in in, in east yeah. so it's, it's, it's just, a fair point yeah. it's just an accident of, of of the way things run fair enough um liam o'sullivan asks um uh, Burton Ports uh, seems to be an outlier. Any insight as to why that would be so high ranking? Uh, sorry, have I turned you off? No, we, 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 yeah. we're still seeing you, yeah. Yeah, Burton Port, the London Derry and Loxwilly Railway, which was the only way to get out to West Donegal, uh, was very badly hit by the strike. And the British had to use uh, Royal Navy destroyers uh, to, to resupply the Coast Guard. Sorry, just one, one or two other slides. Um, this, sorry, this is where the um, this is where the the sources come from, and I, I think I've I've covered through that. This is another thing that's happening in the background, and it explains the adherence of Irish railmen to to their unions, to the British-based unions. You'll see that the railways in Great Britain, the eight-hour day, is conceded, and you'll see and Ireland is added in by a handwriting other than the handwriting that signed it. And it was always believed, and I, I heard this in the 1980s, that the person who put that in was J.H. Thomas, Secretary of the NUR. And indeed, Martin O'Sullivan, who wasn't in the NUR, the driver whom I told you about, he said J.H. Thomas was the best friend that the Irish Railwomen ever had. But people can hold two, in this period, people can hold two diametrically opposed ideas in their heads at the same time. This is a guy called Frank Dempsey from Mallow, who was organizing ASLEF at the time. Um, and he asked to go to De Valera, he asked to go to America for leave of absence to go to America with De Valera in 1920. He asked for, I think, three weeks leave of absence. And he got detained until 1922. And like many things in industrial relations, it gets a bit complex. So there he is coming back in 1922 and asking for his job back. So um, yeah, I see you again. That's that's some of the the, the context and the Sorry, and 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 the, the the background. Fair enough. Um, um Michael says uh, thank you very much. We found out a lot from the talk. Um, Johnny Doyle asks, was there and uh, the quite important question in fact, was there any support from Welsh and English unions uh, re loading equipment onto the boats to Ireland? No. That 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 that, that no. bit of it didn't no. didn't occur. Okay. Um, Declan Byrne uh, says. Donnelly's family believed that the ship at the North Wall was, dis was discharged, but that the trucks for the British Army were not, question. That I don't know. I just have um, Donnelly's witness statement, and I think the important thing was not whether or not the trucks were discharged, but that the dockers refused to handle it, and Royal Engineers discharged it, and that kicked off the, the, the process. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any, if there's any, there's no other questions there at the moment. So all that's left is to say thank you very much uh, from us and um, did you good, good luck with the good luck with the book if you want to, I don't, I don't know if you held it up to the, but want to hold it up there to the, to the screen. I don't, I don't think we saw the, uh, saw the cover earlier. Um, so just does, I don't know if there's a, another question coming in there, just some, some comments. Uh, but yeah, but th thanks for holding that up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we'll, I think we'll leave it there. So. Okay, thank you very much. And good night. Thanks, to you. Thanks for your time now. Thank you.